Let's start by visiting the Raspberry Pi website and downloading the Raspberry Pi installer for your operating system. Once opened, you'll need to choose your device. In my case, I'm going to use the Raspberry Pi 4. The next step is to choose the operating system. You can choose the desktop version, but I'm going to be using the light version. If you choose the desktop version, you can just use the inbuilt terminal, or I'll show you how to connect from a Windows machine in a moment. With the operating system selected, choose the SD card that you're going to write to. You'll be prompted to add some customization. This allows you to set the host name, username, password, local settings, and enable SSH. We'll then save that, apply custom settings, and write to our SD card. Using my Kingston industrial SD card, the process took around one minute and 30 seconds. When we first boot up, the first thing you'll see is the file system is being resized, followed by another screen where it generates its SSH keys. This is normal, and once finished, it will reboot automatically. If it's picked up a 127 IP address, and when trying to log in, it shows unprivileged users are not permitted, it'll likely reboot a second time, at which point it should pick up your actual IP address, typically a 192 address, and allow you to log in with your username and password. Please make a note of your IP address, as we'll be using this throughout the tutorial. To connect remotely to your Raspberry Pi, you'll need an SSH client. For this tutorial, I'm going to be using MOBA Xterm. It's free and available for Windows. I'll leave a link to it below with some other free options for Windows and Mac users. I'm downloading the latest Home Edition installer version. After following the installation instructions, you can right click Sessions, select New Session and choose SSH. Put your IP address of your Raspberry Pi in the remote host box and the username you chose earlier. Accept the prompt and enter your password. If this is the first time running the program, you'll be prompted for a master password to encrypt all your stored passwords. Let's clear the screen and make some space, and the first thing we'll do is install and update our packages. We'll use the combine command, sudo app update, sudo app upgrade minus y, sudo auto remove minus y. This command updates the packages, upgrades them and removes any unwanted setup files, and the minus y stops the process from asking for confirmation speeding up the installation. Depending on your internet speed and number of packages, this initial process took about 12 minutes for me. Security updates are especially important, so we're going to set up unattended updates. We start by installing the unattended upgrades package. Once installed, we reconfigure the package as priority low and accept when prompted. This ensures that we only install the security updates. If we were to update all packages, we could potentially break a dependency. And this approach gives us a balance between security and stability. OK, with the initial setup complete, let's get down to the meat and potatoes. This next command installs the web server Apache, the web services gateway module to run Python applications, and the VEMV library to create virtual environments, which we'll discuss later. Once this is installed, you'll have a working web server, and opening a web browser and putting your IP address of your Raspberry Pi should prove this. If you see the Apache It Works page, we're ready for the next step. The next step is to create a directory for our Flask application. We'll configure Apache to point to this later. We do this by using the sudo make directory command, and then we use the cd command to change into that directory. The next step is important. We need to change the ownership of the directory to our user. In our case, it's Pi. The reason is that currently the directory will be owned by Apache, the WW data group, and we'll be changing this back later. But without this step, we wouldn't have the permissions to install and set up our virtual environment. To create the virtual environment, we use the following command. This creates a new virtual environment named VAMV inside our project directory, shown simply as another directory within our Flask app directory. To activate this virtual environment, we use the following command. You'll notice now that the prompt starts with VMV. This shows that our virtual environment is active. Now we're in the virtual environment, we can install any dependencies. In this case, we're installing Flask. This ensures everything that we do only affects the application that it's intended for. With our dependencies installed, we can now deactivate the virtual environment and later we'll configure Apache to automatically activate this when running our application. With our packages installed, we can now look to our actual Python app. Because Python cares about indentation, I'm going to copy my test scripts from Visio Studio Code right into Nano, the terminal editor, to make sure everything lines up correctly and I avoid mistakes. This file is very simple for a reason, and that's to get us started. So let's run through the lines. From Flask import Flask imports the Flask library. The app line creates a Flask application instance an app.route defines the route for the root URL. So the app route decorator acts as the bridge between the user's URL input and the Python function that handles it. And finally, we define the function itself, which simply returns the hello world message. As you'll see later, we could have multiple routes and the functions can get infinitely more complex. 
Next up is our WSGI config file, which stands for Web Services Gateway Interface. Import sys and import site import the necessary modules. The following line adds the virtual environment site packages directory to the Python search path. You might want to check what version of Python you're running is the same as mine, or to be sure, I'll show you a command how to get the full path when we close this file. The path append adds our application directory to the path, and the last line imports our Flask application, which is the file we've just created, app.py. We can use this command to find our Python version, or to get the full path whilst in our MyFlask app directory, we activate our virtual environment and run the following command. This will show us our site packages path, and once finished, deactivate the virtual environment. With our Python configuration out of the way, we'll now configure our Apache web server. To do this, we create a new config file in the Apache sites available directory. The virtual host block defines a virtual host on port 80, which is the default port for HTTP traffic. Our HTTPS configuration will be created automatically when we install CertBot for our secure connection. Server name specifies the domain name or IP. You'll need to change this for your IP address for now. WSGI daemon process, a daemon process or daemon, is a background process that keeps running, ready to handle incoming web requests for your Python code. This is more efficient than Apache starting a new Python process for every single request. The WSGI process group line links your virtual host to the MyFlask app worker process that you defined in the previous line. The WSGI script alias maps the root URL to our WSGI file. The forward slash acts as a catch-all, directing all requests to your Python application the directory block grants Apache access to your application directory. And finally, we have error log and custom log to define the log file locations. The next step is to enable the site by using the Apache 2 enable site command. And whilst we're at it, we can use the Apache 2 disable site command to disable the default config we no longer need. If you remember earlier, we changed the ownership of the files to our Pi user account so that we could make changes to the directory. It's now time to change the ownership and appropriate permissions back so that Apache can access the files again. If you make any changes to the Apache config or the MyFlask app directory, you'll need to restart Apache. Before we move on to secure our connection with HTTPS, we can check that our Python web server is up and running, which is confirmed here with our Hello World page. Printing Hello World isn't really a great example of using Python, so let's swap out the code and introduce a second route and some more familiar Python logic. For the same reason as before, and to keep things speedy, I've copied and pasted my code. The first line introduces a new module called Request. This allows us to get the information from the form when it's submitted. The default forward slash now includes a bit more HTML and a form to submit our calculation pointing to the calculate URL. We now introduce a second route, which is forward slash calculate, and this is the receiving page where the form is sent. The Python code then assigns the values received into the price and quantity variables and performs a simple calculation to find the total. It then returns either the value as a string or an error message followed by a link back to our default page. OK, fairly simple, but it does give us a good understanding of how we can use Python with HTML. We can check this is working in our browser, but first, as with any change, we must first restart Apache so that our web server sees the updated script. After restarting Apache and refreshing the browser, we should see our simple shopping calculator. This calculator accepts a price and a quantity, and upon submission, it uses Python to calculate the total on our Calculate page, or root. Now, to make our server accessible from the internet securely, we'll enable HTTPS. Instead of just our IP address, we can use a domain name. For this, we'll use DuckDNS, a free service. First, we'll create a directory called DuckDNS. Inside this directory, we'll create a bash script called DuckDNS.sh. To make editing easier, I've prepared the script in a text editor on my Windows machine. Once you've registered at duckdns.org, you'll see a screen similar to this. You can choose any available subdomain, which will always end in duckdns.org. After selecting and submitting your chosen subdomain, it will appear as shown here. We need two pieces of information, your token, which securely identifies your account, and your chosen subdomain. After adding these to the script, we'll copy the content from our editor and paste it into Nano on our Raspberry Pi. Next, we need to make the script executionable. We do this with the following command. Upon running the script, we should see a successful response and we should see no errors in our log files. To automate the process, we'll set up a cron job. Cron is a built-in scheduling service within Linux. We'll configure the cron job to run the duckdns.sh script every five minutes. We can now save this and our script is scheduled. The next step involves configuring your broadband router. 
This process will vary depending on your provider. Typically, you can access your router's settings by entering your router's IP address into your web browser, often ending in dot one. I'm using Virgin Media, and the settings we need are for port forwarding, which in my case are found under the advanced security settings. We'll forward ports 80 and 443, which are used for HTTP and HTTPS respectively, to the corresponding ports on our Raspberry Pi. This ensures that when someone connects to our router via HTTPS, the connection is automatically forwarded to the HTTPS port on our Raspberry Pi. Alright, if we successfully configured our router, we can now access our server from anywhere. To do this, we need our router's external IP address, and you can find this either on the DuckDNS setup page or by simply going to whatsmyip.com. Now, if you enter that IP address into your browser, you should see the shopping calculator we just set up. However, you'll likely notice the warning that says connection is not secure, and that's because we have no certificate. Let's fix that. The first thing we need to do is prepare the Apache MyFlask app configuration file that we created earlier. Temporarily, we'll comment out the WSGI daemon process. The reason for this is that the software that we're using, CertBot, will create a duplicate of this configuration for handling the HTTPS traffic. And this is because you can only have one WSGI daemon process running at one time. Also, I've changed the server name in the configuration file to our DNS name. This is important because it tells CertBot what domain we want our SSL certificate to be issued for. With that done, we can install the CertBot package using the following command. CertBot does a few things for us. It generates a HTTPS configuration file for Apache. It registers our domain with Let's Encrypt, a free and open source certificate authority. And it also downloads and installs the SSL certificate automatically. We'll use the following command to obtain the SSL certificate. We're using the Apache option since that's our web server and we'll specify our domain name. Make sure to replace this with your actual domain name. If you're unsure, you can find this on the Uduk DNS configuration page. After running this command, you should see an output similar to the one below. Now, if we check the site's available directory, we can see that an additional SSL configuration file has been created. And there's one more step, and that's to uncomment the WSGI daemon process in our configuration file. Once that's done, we can save the file and ensure the site is enabled using the following Apache command. To ensure everything's working correctly, we can also run the Apache configuration test, sudo apache ctl config test. As always, whenever we make configuration changes, we need to restart the Apache server. And with that, we now have a fully functioning web server, accessible securely over the internet. If you found this helpful and want more examples of Python web applications, subscribe to the channel. It's the best way to show your interest and keep up to date. I also have a video to further secure Apache, so please check that one out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.